Hey, welcome. We're so glad you're joining us. Uh, we're going to start with a good upbeat song here, so sing along with us. Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Still I met Help now. He's just singing out. Here we go. I need a rescue. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was a orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. You're Save 
pray with me? Heavenly Father, there's uh, such a comfort, such a reassurance to know, God, that um, no matter where we are, no matter how far from you we might feel, no matter what we think we might have done to put distance between ourselves and you, Father, that uh, you're longing for us, you're waiting for us, God, to run to you, to come back to you and just fall in your arms. Confess our need of you, God, and worship you. That's what you're waiting for, Father. So God, right now in this moment, we want to pause and just uh, think about that. Think about where we are. Know that we need to be in your arms, God. And we just take the time right now to surrender ourselves to you, God. Surrender our hearts to you. Surrender our wills. Everything about our lives, God. We thank you for the love and grace and mercy, God, that you shower upon us every day, God. In Jesus' name. Hello church, this is James coming at you from our head office in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'll be sharing with you today our announcements. The first is that today is Compassion Sunday. Um, check out our Compassion table in the lobby and prayerfully consider sponsoring a Compassion child. By partnering with Compassion on a monthly financial basis, you can offer a needy child access to food, clean water, education, resources, and a chance to hear the gospel. Also, starting today is Solomon's Porch. The new session has begun. Uh, join us for our next round of Solomon's Porch called Finding and Following Your God-Given Calling. Dr. Angie Ward, Assistant Director of the Doctor of Ministry program at Denver Seminary, will lead you through video lessons that are aimed at discovering and developing your God-given calling. Dr. Ward will introduce different ways we can define calling, how individu individuals can move through a process of discerning what God is calling them to do with their lives, and how this can be lived out practically and faithfully. Next up is our Potluck and Games Time Well Spent Night. Um, that'll be happening Saturday, May 21st from 6 to 10 p.m. in the Great Room. So join us for this all-church, whole-family event. We'll spend an evening sharing food together, playing board games, and connecting with each other. There is no child care available for this event. However, please bring your own family-friendly games to share and play together. Next up is our Baptism Sunday and our Infant Kid Dedications. On Sunday, May 22nd, we'll be having another Baptism Sunday, and we'll be doing Infant Kid Dedications at that time, too. So if you're interested in getting baptized or having your child dedicated, please let us know. And last is our Peak Kids Sports Camp. That's for um, kids in kindergarten through fifth grade, and uh, you're free to join us for Peak Sports Camp June 6th to 9th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., um, camp kids will participate in awesome sports while learning about who God is through music, Bible studies, and a ton of fun. Please register your kids online. And lastly, you'll see on the screen there are several ways that you can continue to support the church with your tithes and offerings. So please take advantage of that. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. The day my mother found out she was pregnant, my father told her to end the pregnancy or he would leave her. She chose me. He was gone before I took my first breath. As a single, uneducated mother in Villa Flores, Mama struggled every day to provide for us. As a young girl, I would think about my future. Would I ever become someone? The voices of my neighborhood said, you're just a poor child. Your future is set. You will never become anything. I needed someone to change my future. 
I joined the compassion program at my church. Then, one day, I shared my dream with my sponsor. My sponsor's reply was simple. Yanelli, I love you, and I believe in you. Sometimes you can't believe in a dream until someone else believes it with you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. My name is Yaneli Suero, doctor, wife, mother, and a precious daughter of God. Right now, there are millions of children all over the world who are desperate for someone to believe in their future, just like I was. On this Compassion Sunday, you can tell a child in poverty you believe in their future. Sponsor a child today. Hi, my name is Heidi Greer Larkin, and this Sunday is Compassion Sunday. I can't wait to see what God does through Family in Christ. But I'd like to begin by sharing a story with you, a story of hope. When I was 12 years old, my, my family suffered a series of severe setbacks, and we went from living in a four-bedroom house in Lake Arbor to having no home at all. It was devastating. Well, my parents moved to Texas in search of opportunity, and we lived in a campground for one whole summer. We moved every couple of weeks, and the campground host helped us to keep things moving along. They were awesome people and so helpful. But every morning, my dad would leave to search for work. Mom and I stayed in camp, and with my brother, we'd be reading books and figuring out what we could cook and stretch the food that we had, you know, as long as possible. Every morning, my dad would, would go to town, um, and every night he would come home, and I would go to the front of the campground and meet him there. And then I would race him back to our camp. It was really a time when I spent doing, like, regular things. I spent a lot of time at the lake. There were fishermen there that would catch catfish as big as me and they would leave little pieces of bait and some fishing line here and there and if I was lucky I would find a hook and I could get a stick and make a fishing pole. I spent a lot of time fishing and reading and cooking and I really didn't know that I was homeless. Eventually things worked out for us and my mom used to quote one of my favorite scriptures, and it's one of hers, and that's Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not into your own understanding. And that's what we did. We trusted. We had hope. Can you imagine not having hope? Well, when I first learned of sponsoring a child, it was here at Family in Christ during Holy Week. And I want to introduce you. This is Trevor. This is the first child that we sponsored, and this is him five years ago. And I want to show you Trevor today. Here's Trevor with a smile on his face. Five years later, he is a child of God, and he has a future. He wants to be a doctor. I'm so excited that we've been able to make a difference in his life. And Michael and I sponsor four other children. And honestly, if I could and I had the means, I would choose and sponsor every single child in our compassion box. But we can't. And so that's why I'm here today is, is to appeal to you. Maybe you can help us. Every one of the children in this box has been chosen for family in Christ. I'll give you a couple of previews. Here's Camilla. She has been on the list for 100 
160 days waiting for a sponsor. Here's another one. Here's Alizar. He's been waiting for over 172 days. And this is an opportunity to change a life. This is God's this is an answer to God's call to help the poor. When you say yes, your sponsorship connects a child with resources there that, with, that will help him with, with future development, but most importantly, with a church to help him or her develop their relationship with Christ. And as I said today, now, I reflect on the challenges I've had in my life as opportunities because I always had hope. And I, I mean, hope means so much. If you feel like God is calling you to sponsor a child today, please make your way out to our compassion table. And I will help you to choose a child, answer any questions that you have. And if you're online, please contact Family in Christ, and, and I will follow up to help you choose a child. Here's a a way that you can truly make a difference in someone's life forever. I can't wait to see how God moves in our church today. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you with us. We've begun after Easter this new series on 2 Corinthians that we've entitled How God Uses Our Brokenness. And today we're going to take the next step in looking at this book as we read the next section of verse of chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, uh, these words. Now, this is our hope. Our conscience tes testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially in our relation with you, with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. For we do not write you anything you cannot read or understand. And I hope that, as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Because I was confident of this, I wanted to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I fickle when I intended to do this? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say both yes, yes, and no, no? But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no. In him, it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so, through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, put his seal, his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. I call on God as my witness, and I stake my life on it that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, it, it, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should ma have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone who forgives, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes." I recently heard of a story, a true story, of uh, two unmarried sisters who lived in the same house, 
But because of, of a misunderstanding, they no longer spoke to each other. They were unwilling and unable to move out of the house they owned, so they continued to use the same rooms, the same table, the same bedroom, with, all without speaking to each other. And at one point, they took a piece of chalk and drew a line that divided the house in two. The chalk line ran right through the middle of the house, and it divided the kitchen table, the stove, the refrigerator, the cupboard. This chalk allowed each sister to come and go, to eat and sleep, to sew and read, all without crossing onto the other sister's territory. Every night as they went to sleep, they could hear each other's breathing, but they didn't talk. They didn't talk about the things that mattered, the things that would lead toward reconciliation and forgiveness. And so as a result, these two sisters lived together for years in stifling silence separated by a chalk line which neither would cross nor erase. Now, the story would be humorous were it not so tragic, were it not so, frankly, descriptive of the dynamic of some of our own relationships. Some of us have sisters or brothers or family members, or co-workers, or fellow church members, or people in our neighborhood in which conflict has resulted in a chalk line being drawn between us. And like the sisters in the story, we often come close to each other in terms of proximity, but neither of us talk about the chalk line we don't talk about the things that matter that might lead to reconciliation. It hurts, doesn't it? I mean, it's painful when you come close to someone that there's a chalk line between you and them. And over time, if that chalk line isn't dealt with, it ends up turning into permanent marker and eventually into bricks and mortar. And I've known people who have ignored each other for years because nothing was done to deal with that chalk line, with that misunderstanding. And it isn't God's way. I mean, misunderstandings are inevitable in life. In life, it isn't a matter of if we will feel misunderstood. It's simply a matter of when. Paul felt misunderstood by some of the people in this church of Corinth. And in our text this morning, we see how he responds to that misunderstanding, how he takes that chalk line and starts to erase it, and how he encourages us by his example to, to keep the chalk in our pocket or to erase the chalk line if it's already been drawn. And so we're going to take a look this morning at how to respond when we are misunderstood. If we're interested in erasing the chalk lines between us and another person, the first thing we need to be ready to do is to identify the reason that chalk line is there. That is, what is the issue that is between the two of us? A problem well-defined is half solved. Let me say that again. A problem well-defined is half solved. One of the difficulties in reducing conflict is never really identifying the issue that put the chalk on the floor in the first place. Now, what put the chalk line on the floor for these Corinthians was that the Christians there had gotten wind that Paul was planning to visit them on the way to Macedonia and then on the way back as well. Verse 16 says as much. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. 
And so they were excited about the prospect of seeing him again. And there was a great deal of anticipation. And the Corinthians probably had made all sorts of preparations for his coming. And then Paul doesn't show up. He decides that he will bypass them on the way to Macedonia. And then these young believers were disappointed. They were hurt. Some of them were downright ticked off. And so they took a piece of chalk and drew a line and said, we want nothing to do with that guy anymore. And so Paul writes this letter largely in response to how they were feeling about being slighted. And we can see it in verse 23. And he knows what's bothering them and he identifies the issue here. I call God as my witness, stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth, nor that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. Now, if you're acquainted with the first letter Paul writes to this same Corinthian church, you may know that there were a number of issues that that could have caused them to draw a chalk line between the two of them. But Paul here identifies uh, the fact that there's this misunderstanding. He says, I know what I've done, and I know that it has confused you. I know there are those among you that are critical of it. But it's interesting, at least to me, that the conflict here isn't one that's a rela- or a theologically kind of based problem. The conflict is an emotional, relational problem. It wasn't a disagreement they had theologically. It was a relational disappointment. See, Paul didn't meet their expectations. The Corinthians felt slighted. How many marriages have split? or business partnerships ended because of relational disappointment. Paul understands that they have felt slighted, and he identifies the problem. And that's the first thing we need to do when we feel misunderstood. We need to sit down and we need to identify the issue. Tell me what you think the issue is, and I'll tell you what I think the issue is so that we can both start working on it. Verse 23 tells us the first step in reducing conflict is to identify the issue. The second thing to do when you find yourself overcome by misunderstanding is to clarify your intentions. Read down to, with me at verse 1 of chapter 2. So Paul writes, I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. Paul tells us that the reason he did not visit the Corinthians at this time was because he sensed that it would be a painful experience for them that would result in a great deal of sorrow for them and for him because the timing wasn't right. Sometimes reducing conflict is a matter of timing. We need to be patient. I'm not going to press that issue right now, we say to ourselves. More work needs to occur in my heart. More work needs to occur in their heart. Then we'll be ready to deal with it. You see, most of us think that that conflict is primarily between two people. It is an interpersonal sort of a thing. But the truth is, Conflicts are primarily intrapersonal. They are within the individual. Now, let me see if I can make that case with you. Imagine one afternoon you come home from work and, well, it's a day like this weekend, uh, a day of sun. The, maybe the boss just announced that he was going to give you a raise and You get home after a calm and relaxing drive to the house, put up your feet on the chair, 
And then your five-year-old comes into the room and spills some milk. So now let's rewind the tape a moment. You come home from work that day, and you've been fighting traffic the whole time. It is hot. You're tired. You suspect that your boss is taking advantage of you. You come into the house fuming. You sit down, stomp down onto the couch, and then your five-year-old spills a glass of milk. Any difference in terms of your response? Listen to what Newton Maloney says. Conflicts are states of mind. They are personal inside the person feelings. People go into conflict over problems when they feel that their opinions are not being respected or when they fail to persuade others or when they fear they may even be rejected by them. All to say, when someone feels conflicted, we need to give them some time to work on their conflicted feelings. The Corinthian church needed time to, to look at why Paul's not being there had so led to them feeling conflicted. Were they, for example, too closely tied to his uh, being there that they'd found their value in that? I mean, we need time to think through why it is that we find ourselves conflicted at times. And Paul doesn't just drop everything and try to smooth things out for them. He realizes that they need some time to learn from the fact that his skipping Corinth had sent them into conflict. Now, there is surely an interpersonal dimension to conflict, but Paul understands that conflict must first be dealt with within the individual. And so he clarifies his intention. That's the second step. Verse 4, For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know of my depth of love for you. One of the most important things we can do when we're trying to bridge a misunderstanding is to let the other person know how important they are to us, how we care about them. Even when we are going through conflict, that relationship matters to us, we want to say. We can do it verbally. You might do it through a letter. That's what Paul does here. In his letter, he says, I just want you to know the depth of my love. And so that's a third step, if you will, to reducing conflict uh, when misunderstandings come, is to reaffirm your love. Now, look, you can follow all those steps and still get no response from the person on the other side of the chalk line. Do you know why? Because, as we said, the conflict is not just a line between people. It's a conflict within the person. And there's nothing you can do to change how someone else feels on the inside. If their sense of peace is based on always having to have things go their way and life isn't going their way, there's not a lot you can do about that. But see, our motivation shouldn't be to get that other person to respond. Our motivation is to be to do what's right in God's eye. And that's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, some of us are tempted to forget the first two phrases and to think that it is our job to be at peace with everyone. And so we run away or run around taking responsibility for everyone in sight. We erase the side of every chalk line we see and we try to push people onto the other side of the room. But Paul says, as far as it depends on you, your responsibility is your side of the chalk line. So have you identified the issue? Have you clarified your intentions? Have you reaffirmed your love? And if you have done those things, 
it's an honorable thing in God's eye. Now, the person on the other side of the chalk line, they're going to need to make some decisions and take some steps too. But you can't take those steps for them. You need to trust that God is at work in their lives. In verse 5, Paul portrays his willingness to work on the conflict and to hopefully to inspire the Corinthians to do the same for him. Apparently, and this is the back story, there was an individual in this Corinthian church that had said or done some things that were attempts to discredit Paul. So much so that the Corinthian church called him on it and were punishing him for it. And so Paul's response to that situation is verse 5. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Verse 10, anyone who forgives, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. So in his response... Paul shows us a fourth principle for reducing conflict, and it is to forgive without strings attached. The goal in the midst of conflict should not be to to get revenge, but to reconcile, to not say, I'm going to make you pay for what you've done to me, because as you probably know, Anyone trying to get revenge is inevitably someone filled with bitterness. You say, well, I'm not a revenge-seeking person. I forgive people. But, you know, there's a couple different ways to forgive. I mean, there's a form of forgiveness that says, okay, I'll forgive you, but if you ever do that again, That's conditional forgiveness. So have you ever been on the receiving end of that kind of forgiveness? I mean, you don't feel free. You feel like you're always walking on eggshells with that person. You feel like they're watching you like a hawk, and you know that if you ever come close to what you did before, they will come after you like there's no tomorrow. That is conditional forgiveness. But there's a second kind of forgiveness, and it's displayed when we say, I know I'll probably never be able to forget the hurt, but I choose now to not keep holding it over your head. I choose to bury it. That's forgiveness without probation. That's the kind of forgiveness we receive from Christ. I'm struck by how Lou Smeads, a mentor of mine, talked about forgiveness. He described it as a kind of spiritual surgery where we take a a knife and we separate the person who has so deeply hurt us from the hurt itself. And then we can look at the person and not just always see the hurt. And really, that's what God alludes to in the Psalm 103, where it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. And so, some of the people in the Corinthian church wanted revenge, but this guy that Paul speaks of had done something wrong to Paul. And they felt like they needed to punish him. But Paul says, enough. Verse 6, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. And so the next step in reducing conflict is to forgive without strings attached. You see, the problem with forgiving with strings attached 
is that those strings that we keep holding on to, well, they end up tripping us and binding us, controlling us. As long as we hold on to that memory of the hurt, we just keep opening the wound over and over and over again. Lou Smeets once said, that to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. And so forgive without strings attached. And then there's one last step in reducing conflict. It's found at the end of verse 10. I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. The last step to reducing conflict is to anticipate Satan's schemes. Ephesians 4 says, In your anger do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. So what is Satan's scheme exactly? Well, it's not terribly creative, but it's very effective. Do you know what it is? It's simply to divide and conquer. See, if Satan can exploit conflict so that people are drawing chalk lines between each other, then he knows he is crippling their ability to grow and be effective. If he can get his church polarized, he can also get it crippled. It's Satan who brings back those hurts you have of the past. It's Satan that ends up getting you to ruminate over and over on them again. He wants to keep you conflicted because when you're conflicted, well, then you're isolated. And then you've fallen into his schemes. Uh, Corey Ten Boom was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps during World War II. After the war, she wrote, of an encounter she had had a few years after when she ended up confronting a guard who had been at the concentration camp in which she had been living. Let me read what she writes. So it was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavyset man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were following out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of the wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to a defeated Germany with a message that God forgives. After my message, people stood up in silence. In silence, collected their wraps. In silence, left the room. And that's when I saw him. Working his way forward against the others, one moment I saw that overcoat and brown hat, the next a blue uniform and visor cap with its skull and crossbones. And then it came back in a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead light, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man, I could see my sister, frail form ahead of me, ribs, sharp, sharp ribs beneath the parchment skin. The place was Ravenbrook, and the man who was making his way forward had been a guard, one of the most cruel guards. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out, saying, A fine message, Fräulein. And I, who had just spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocket rather than take his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among so many thousands of women? But I remembered him and that leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravenbrook in your talk. I, I was a guard there, he said. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he said, I have become a Christian. I know that God now forgives me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fräulein. 
Again, the hand came out. Do you forgive me? And I stood there. I who sinned over and over. I who talked about forgiveness could not forgive. My sister Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand out, but to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do, for I knew I had to do it, not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience since that end of the war, I had been at home in Holland as with victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were also able to return to their outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what physical scars. But those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. Still, I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion, I knew that. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I, I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling, Jesus. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But then I realized it was not my love. I had tried, but I didn't have the power. But when God helped me, that's when I found the strength. God doesn't want a world full of relational chalk lines that divide us. He gives us the strength we need to move through these steps we talked about. But it starts with the choice, and it ends with a request, God help me. We live in a broken world. All of us have experienced being misunderstood. But God is the one that has first forgiven us and gives us the strength to forgive each other. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful so grateful for the forgiveness that we have experienced in you. And we pray that as that reality becomes deeply seated within our souls, we will indeed find the power and the courage and the strength to forgive those who have injured us. Lord, we know that you never wish for us to, to find ourselves alienated from each other. We ask that you would be with us as we take time to reflect on the relationships we have with, with our own families, with those who are close to us and friends and people right here at church perhaps even, that you will help us to, to have the courage to, to begin that process of once more experiencing the joy of being with each other. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing one more song together before we close the service. Uh, sing along with us. This might be a new one to you, or you may know it. Either way, we hope that uh, this service has drawn you closer to God today. Before I spoke a word. You were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I 
took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night and night. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down.